morning, everyone. Let's go. Lord, in honoring our Ignatian tradition, our heritage, very much who we are. And um, people have asked me in the last several days why it is that we do this. Who we are and what we're about is why we do this. And we really lean into our heritage as a university that recognizes our tradition and our roots, our spirituality, and our reason for being. And it is that Ignatian heritage. And we are people who stand on the shoulders of those who've gone before us. And it's important to remind ourselves of that every now and then. The reason for being who we are and who we're called to be. We're stronger because of those shoulders that we stand on, because of their courage, we're wiser because of their words, and we are lifted up because of all that they have done for us. And so we stand on the shoulders of those who have came before us. We stand on the shoulders of one like Pedro or Rupe. And so the University of Scranton created this award in 1995 to recognize persons who have furthered in a very significant way our Ignatian mission. The award is named for the late Father Pedro Arrupe of the Society of Jesus. He was the 28th Superior General of the Society, a man who lived his words, who expressed in work and in deed qualities of spiritual depth, religious devotion, generous service, and commitment to a faith that does justice. And so the 2009 Award will be given this morning to Father John Foley of the Society of Jesus, educator, founder of the Cristo Rey Network of Schools, and Mary Bodwin, assistant for social ministries for the Jesuit province of New Orleans. So at this time, I invite you to join with us in the spirit of faith, of justice, and of prayer. And I ask now that. Uh, this is Betty Roselle, Assistant Director of Career Services. I'm forward to give our opening prayer and invocation. So our first award will be presented to Mary Baudouin, Assistant for Social Ministries for the Jesuit Province of New Orleans. And uh, because of Mary's great work promoting the social ministries of that province and beyond, um, we've asked that Pat Carl, Director of Community Outreach Office, um, read the citation. family home was destroyed by Hurricane Katrina, volunteers rallied around to lovingly rebuild their house as they started their life here. For a woman who has dedicated her life to the service of others, the wrath of Hurricane Katrina became a rare moment in Mary's life when others came to her rescue. Over the last 30 years, Mary has worked tirelessly in a variety of social and lay ministries and charities from the nation's capital to flood-stricken New Orleans. As assistant for social ministries for the Jesuits of the New Orleans provinces, she coordinates social ministry and social justice activities for Jesuit priests, lay colleagues, and institutions in a 10-state area. Through her service on the Jesuit Social Research Institute at Loyola University, she works to promote research, social analysis, theological reflection, and strategies for improving the social and economic conditions in the southern United States and in parts of the Caribbean and Latin America. When the United States bishops wrote their pastoral letter on the economy in 1987, it was Mary who 
coordinated the Office of Implementation for the United States Catholic Conference Office of Social Development and World Peace. When the Associated Catholic Charities of New Orleans needed a strategic plan to guide their 60-plus program, they turned to Mary. When the Office of the Social Apostolate of the Archdiocese of New Orleans established a community organization for the elderly, it was Mary who led the cause. Any of these accomplishments on their own would be enough for one person, but Mary's compassionate care for all people has led her to more. She serves on the boards of the Jesuit Volunteer Corps South, the Ignatian Solidarity Network, Reconciled Mourning, and the Harry Thompson Center for the Homeless. Like the legendary Father Pedro Arupe, Mary Baldwin is an extraordinary example of what it means to be a person for others, a person who has made distinguished contributions to the Ignatian ministry and mission, mission and ministries. Therefore, the University of Scranton is proud to honor Mary Baldwin, Assistant for Social Ministries for the Jesuits of the New Orleans Province, recipient of the Pedro Arupe SJ Award for 2009, today, March 24th, 2009. years, for about, but for about four of those seven years, I really didn't know what the hell I was doing. 
since I was very young. I was really inexperienced and, in, and really naive. And in church work, it might be okay to be young and inexperienced, but it's not so good to be naive. Uh, I was outspoken when I should have shut up. I shut up when I should have spoken out. Uh, there were times when I should have curbed my enthusiasm, and other times when I should have been a lot more hopeful. But wonderful things happened in parishes and among parishioners in spite of me. Food pantries opened, bereavement ministries started, legislative networks were formed, and I learned that people's hearts and their desire to do good and make good was much more powerful than anything I could teach or organize, and that God's plan is much bigger and more effective than mine. So I suppose, as they say, this is some evangelist church, I learned to let go and let God, and this is a lesson I still have to learn every single day. After my seventh year, I call it a kind of a paid internship at Catholic Charities, which is what I did. Uh, I went to work with the U.S. Catholic bishops, helping to implement the, their pastoral lettering on the U.S. economy that was promulgated in 1987. And after years of talking to people in the pews about how the church is the people and not the hierarchy, I found myself in the middle of the belly of the beast, uh, the, the bishops' conference. And thank God I was not so naive that I would have been in a um, but what I've learned from the bishops and the hierarchy is that they are searching just like you and I are, searching for ways to speak to people, to build the faith, to read the signs and the times and respond. You know, like many of us do, they sit around tables, they, 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 they think of alternatives, they explore possibilities. And though some might like us to believe the opposite, I have learned from them that the church is not stayed. It's not finished and it's not in its final form. It's a work in progress and I'm part of that work too. And I thank God for this gift of insight. It really helps me to stay in the church and to stay an active member. For the longest two years of my life, I worked as a real community organizer with low income elderly people. They worked on issues like high utility bills, access to buildings, the cost of public transportation. And they were feisty and direct and brave. And local businesses, business owners, local politicians feared them as much as I did. Um, their actions were over. But when they, you know, they would do actions, they would protest at city council, they would you know, do direct political actions on, um, with politicians. But when they were over, they put their signs down. They loved on those politicians and business owners like they were their own sons and daughters. And in turn, they got the respect that those people gave to their own mothers. And I from them, I learned that anger and justice have to go hand in hand with a lot of loving and respect for the people that you're trying to change. And that the two can't ever be separated. And this is that what Father Arupe said in a quote, that the promotion of justice and if the promotion of justice is indispensable, it's the first step to charity. But we should, should go beyond justice and crown it with charity. I think we need to practice justice with love. But it's, it's modern, in modern time. I'm going to skip about 10 years. Um, <laughs> but, oh, that's, it, it, that, that's a 10 years that's kind of a blur because I spent my time as a working mom. Um, and that's actually where I think I've had my greatest experience of the gifts of God's love because nothing has brought me closer to God than loving and being loved by my own children. But in, I'm going to come up to my current ministry, where I work for the Jesuits in New Orleans province, trying to animate social justice and charity among Jesuits in our works, so that we can really live out the faith that does justice and make it come alive. And I have, in the last six years, seen it come so alive in the integration of Ignatian spirituality and the intellectual apostolate that allows Jesuits and Jesuit works and our Jesuit collaborators to put the best of their charisms at the service of the and the promotion of justice. I've seen it come alive in the enthusiasm and the hope of high school and college students and Jesuit volunteers who give so many hours of service and who stand, sometimes against great odds, as witnesses for justice on their campuses, in their cities, and at places like the gates of Fort Benning. And I've seen it in the spirit of collaboration and community <coughs> that we as Fed in New Orleans especially experienced uh, after Hurricane Katrina, when over 6,000 students and Jesuit volunteers, including University of Cincinnati students, uh, have come 
um, through our Heaven's Katrina Relief Office to help us rebuild our homes and streets, but most importantly, our hope. When Jesuit volunteers scraped muck from my own flooded house and washed mold from my walls, and it was so humbling, but also such a gift. <coughs> from them, I and many others in the New Orleans province have learned the gift of humility of being ministered to and being held up and made strong by the prayers and the service and the strength of others standing in solidarity with us at our time of most incredible need. Um, with the help of judges from all over the world, uh, we received almost $2 million uh, to keep, and we were able to keep every single one of our ministries open. I think that's a huge accomplishment, but we only did it because so many people were so generous to us. And people, you know, some Jesuit communities in the places that were so poor, you couldn't even imagine that they could scrape enough money together. And they did it, they held us up. With the help of students, we've been able to gut 240 homes, rebuild 140 others. And students have provided 132,000 hours of labor worth two and a half million dollars to our Jesuit schools. And so today, it's so humbling that, that people came to our aid in this way. And today I accept this award with such a great heart for these men and women for others who have ministered to me in my times of bubbling and strength, but more importantly, who have ministered at, to others and to our broken world. They made real for me the words of Father Rube, who spoke in 1981. Love has no boundaries because it reproduces on a human scale the infiniteness of the divine essence and gives to each of our brothers and sisters a claim to our unlimited service. Thank you so much. Washington Post, 60 Minutes, and Philanthropist Bill and Melinda Gates, 
who have provided almost $16 million of support for the schools that many said would never succeed. In 2005, Father Gilbert was named president of the Crystal Ray Network, which today includes 12 schools nationwide and plans to open 11 new schools in the next two years. Many of the students will tell you that they would never have gone to college had it not been for the Crystal Ray. And most anyone who knows Father Bowling will tell you that the success of the Crystal Ray Network and its students is largely attributable to its leader's charismatic personality and boundless energy. By his example, Father Bowling has inspired thousands to the cause of education for the marginalized. His work has been recognized through honorary degrees from Georgetown, Fordham, and Marquette universities. In 2007, the National Catholic Education Association awarded Father Bowling the seat Newsweek named him among Who's Next for 2007. In 2008, President George Bush presented him with the Presidential Citizens Medal, the second highest civilian honor in the United States. Today, the University of Scranton celebrates the work of a man who is dedicated to transforming lives through the power of education. The University of Scranton is proud to honor Reverend John P. Foley, S.J., Executive Chairman of the Crystal Ray Network, recipient
three of us who were organizing the school. I should be embarrassed to say this, but I'm not. And he turned to us and said, have you thought about how you're going to finance it? <laughs> well, I couldn't have questioned <laughs> Frankly, no. <laughs> so uh, what was brilliant, we, we had the idea to hire a consultant. And so we did. And uh, this is one of those times when a consultant was uh, invaluable. And we, we knew this person who, was, who thought outside the box. And so we said, give us some ideas on how to finance a school and people can't want the money to pay for it. So he said, let me think about it. And he came back a couple weeks later. He said, well, every student had a job. And that was the beginning of, that was the beginning of this whole model. And so uh, that's how this whole thing started. We opened in September of 1996. And I like to say, because it's true, that the first day of school, I wanted to hide under the desk. I didn't, I, I thought, I, we hadn't, we hadn't, we hadn't uh, tried it out. We hadn't proven that this was going to work yet. I don't know how you do that, except by doing it. So I thought, I, my, my worst nightmare was that, in 10 minutes, the phone's going to ring, and they're going to say, you know, these kids, I'm going to get them. I mean, what am I supposed to do with these adolescents? And, uh, and what was my surprise, I am not kidding you, that same day we did get telephone calls thanking us for the kids that we were sending to the schools. Ladies and gentlemen, the biggest mystery to this whole thing is why this works so well. Uh, you, they, have to, they, they all have to be 14 years of age, which is not a problem. Um, they have to be 14, they have to have papers, which is a problem. But they have to have papers because they work, not because, they, not because they're students. So. Um, we began in 1996 with 79 students, and um, those were divided for a bunch of reasons that have nothing to do with education. They were divided between sophomores and juniors. We started with sophomores and juniors, and, and today, and this is an example of how fast this, this network is growing. Uh, we were just told that the network has 12 schools. The, school has 12, the network has 22 schools today. That's how fast it's growing. The last thing that that um, that uh, they knew was that it was 12. Well, it was 12 about two years ago, but today it's 22. And we have uh, 5,000 students studying at pre-tory schools. So this is what? Uh, 13 years later, after 1996, 12 years, 12 academic years after the school opened, the first school, after the first model was even tried. So we have a tiger by the tail. In, what is a pre-tory school? First of all, you have to be needing to come to, you have to be economically needing to come to our school. And, and, and provable. You, you, provide your, uh, you provide your tax returns and uh, you give a report and, and every student that enters a Cristo Rey school throughout the country has to show <coughs> and give proof that they are, that they are, that they are economically needy. We have a, an extremely complicated formula to, that you have to be below. I, 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 I was amazed at how hard it was to get us all together about that. But uh, interesting, interesting. But we, 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 you have, our schools are exclusively for the poor. They're exclusive schools. Uh, the first one to make me understand it was Mayor Daly. And uh, he said, my, my children couldn't go to your school. He said, I guess we came back home and said, I guess he's right. I guess he's right because they have to be. So um, somebody said, if you can afford to come to our school, then you can't come. <laughs>
which is a model which we really didn't realize. Somebody asked me this morning, how, how did you get, how did the movement begin? It began without our even knowing it. It began with our opening for one school, wanting to hide under the desk, and here we are 12 years later when we were saying, hey, this thing works. And after about five years, we said this thing works so well, why don't we talk about, why don't we talk about extending it to other schools? We've never, we've never taken the initiative. We have all our schools are the results of grassroots people that, that, wanted, that got in touch with us. There are 22 schools today, and there are five more on the pipeline. Uh, so it's a new educational model, a, a new educational model. Uh, these kids love the job across the board. What when you ask them at the end of the year what they what they to critique the school year? What did you most like? The job, the job, the job. Even though they're bored and they don't like to file, they're all office jobs. They're all office jobs. They they're treated like an adult. They they're, they're you can see their self esteem growing. You can see that you can. See that they just feel so good about themselves. They had no idea that this that, uh, that they were going to be able to go to work in that 40-story building downtown. So, it, and then therefore they're getting, they're, therefore they're more excited about going to school. It's kind of an immediate application of what you learn in school. It's, it's, uh, so the, 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 the idea that they're, that they're going to school and they can see people and rub elbows with people who have also gone to, uh, you know, Good schools and gone through college and do no longer until they ask, are you going to college? They ask, what college are you going to go to? So the supposition is all that they're going to go. Um, it's a new method of financing. That's the most important thing, I think, to, about, to understand about our model. That it's, it's a new method of financing private education. And we have, so we have uh, these kids, typically, every school is a tiny bit different, but all of them. The jobs are divided among four students, and um, so therefore, if the job is twenty-five thousand dollars, each student is is, uh, is um, contributing six thousand two hundred fifty dollars to the school, plus another thousand dollars. They're going to be all students pay something, maybe twenty dollars a month, and maybe one hundred twenty dollars a month. But all that they also that's how we uh, that's how we do a new method of financing. This year we have. We have 1,252 contracts with, with different uh, different offices. And the last time our kids were, uh, were uh, they, they went through, they were, they were assessed, they were asked. They were, the last time we asked these supervisors how they're doing, 87% got good or outstanding from their supervisor. And they're all paying money for this. So and it's a job. It's a job. It's not, this is not charity. It's, it's a job. So um, I'm going to get my show too. I hate to do that, but uh, I love talking about these stories. So, um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, just let me say that um, thanks for the, thanks for the study that Gates just funded for us. We are kind of altering our course. We're not. We're going to start uh, uh, paying a lot more attention to the quality of education that we give. To how do we get these kids from a, a, a fifth grade, sixth grade level? To a 12th grade level in four years. How do we, and if we, if we be able to uh, take that very seriously and put all our efforts in that? But we still have five more schools in the pipeline, so we continue to grow. And as someone said recently, uh, if if we fail, frankly, there's no one behind us. So that uh, the private education is uh, our model is very precarious. I've never said that in public. But our model is very precarious. It still takes a lot. We're still learning. It still takes a lot of care and cultivation. But, uh, but you know, we can't keep the demand is there. We can't keep them away. They, 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 people want to be given. It's, it's, it's the it's the it's the what beacon of hope for the inner city uh, adolescents. And just let me. Uh, statistic, the one that I like most, is um, this this year, it's anticipated that the 5,000 students across the pre-story network are going to contribute almost $27 million to their own education. So well, that's the one I like most. And they're, they, are, they are definitely, they, they, they even said it to the teacher sometime, hey, well, I'm paying your salary. <laughs> Um, 
some great quotes too. I just uh, the uh, once there was a visit to uh, all of us teachers should hear this. But once there was uh, a visit to one of our schools, and one of the students was showing this person around, and the person said, "Well, uh, Luis, what's the difference between work and school?" And Luis stopped for a minute. He said, "At work, you gotta get it right the first time." <laughs> So, um, profound thanks to the University of Stratton, and uh, thank you, friends, for your support and just your interest in being here this morning and the, main, the spirit of Pedro will be continued to uh, excite us.
one can help our neighbors as Mary, Lord Wynn, and Father John Foley have shown us. Each and every day we are called to make decisions, some seemingly very minor, and some that will affect many. How we make these decisions impacts our world and our neighbors. We all decide between service, serving others, and serving self each and every day. A simple choice we are called to make, service or self. After learning of the wonderful gifts that Mary and, and Father John Foley have been giving so freely, I am truly humbled and grateful for their unselfish service to neighbor. When Mary Bojwin had to make the decision self or service, the answer was service, and her gifts have touched many people. When Father John Foley had to make the decision self or service, the answer was service, and his gifts have touched many to honor these fine servants of God in the name of Father Pedro Rupe is so very appropriate. A mission for justice, a battle against evil. As we pray together celebrating, celebrating Mary Bowdoin and Father John Foley's service, ask yourself, how am I making decisions? Is it for self or is it for service? Thank you everyone today for your presence. You make a difference.